Before we start, I want to remind everyone to please check the pinned comment under this video as well as my community tab, both of which will contain updates about how the hiatus is going and when I'll be back. More on that at the end of the video. Welcome to Grifters. The story of six characters with very little in common, where everyone but the literal Thieves Guild thug is wearing some kind of mask. If you're new around here, welcome aboard. This is as good a place as any to start watching, since we've just finished off several major quest lines, both vanilla and modded, and we're about to enter the next phase of the story. If you haven't been keeping up over the last 94 episodes and 6 trailers, you may be asking yourself what Grifters even is. And if you have been keeping up, many thanks, Syrah. If you're expecting a walkthrough or a mod showcase series, this isn't any of those. Grifters is a long-form, long-running story set in Skyrim with an ensemble cast that lacks the meta-knowledge that I have as their driver. This is my second time doing a series like this, with the first one being the Dawnbreaker saga, which followed a completely different cast of characters through their own journeys. Both series have had the same goal. Rather than having one Dragonborn become all-powerful through doing all of the main quest lines, we instead have multiple characters with complicated pasts all slowly coming together over the course of the game, as they become more and more powerful players in the province of Skyrim. Atlug, Cactus, Solvander, Myth, Syra, and Enna all operate in the same version of the world, which means that the actions one character takes may have an effect on the others. Spoiler warning! In this video, I'll be doing exactly what it says on the tin, going over the story so far, organized more or less by character. I'll also be including what we know so far of each of their backstories. While I don't think there have been any major groundbreaking plot twists so far in the series, there will be spoilers for a few quest lines, including the mod Teldrin Sirius. If you're only looking to brush up on who these people are, I've divided each section between character and gameplay, so feel free to skip around to the parts you want to see and leave the rest. Let's away then, shall we? Carlisle, I don't know if we've met. I'm not exactly the definition of careful. Atla Gryazgosh, Captain of the Scarlet, is one of two characters in this cast who was built specifically for this story, rather than as a test or concept challenge character. She is the Grifter, in spite of being perhaps the most straightforward of the six. A lightly armored orcish pirate with a warhammer who looks like she'd sooner knock you into the drink than buy you an ale, though her knack for hospitality is second to none. Lug the Thug comes from a family of fences from Anvil Cyrodiil, and learned early on how to take care of her ship and crew under the guidance of her mother, Yazgosh, captain of the Broken Ghost. So while she may be fully capable of gallagering heads with that hammer of hers, she also knows the value of a good story and a good song to lift morale. She's also been known to wade into battle to the tune of a sea shanty. My body lies over the ocean. My body lies over the sea. My body lies over the ocean. Would you please stop screaming at me? Right. This elk's blowing my cover. Stealth is not her strong suit, which means that if bribes and intimidation won't solve her problems, the pirate queen of Lost Port Cavern has a tendency to go for the brute force approach. And boy howdy! She can force a lot of brutes to bend the knee. And everything else for that matter. Adlug's tale began with a jailbreak out of the Castle Dower dungeons, having been apprehended in her trailer for trying to report Jari Ra to the guards before he and his own crew could run the Ice Rudder aground. Snitches get stitches, as they say, and Atlug emerged onto the Solitude docks to find the Scarlet missing, presumably taken by the Blackbloods as collateral. After taking care of what was left of the Ice Runner, Atlug proceeded to tear a path across the north coast of Hoffingar before finally finding her ship, Sans Crew, at Lostport Cavern, which she quickly took over. In search of gold to spruce up Lostport and hire a crew, she headed to Windhelm, did a quick favor for the East Empire Trading Company to cut down the competition, then headed south to Riften in the company of the bickering, definitely not an item, Syrah and Myth. There, she joined the Thieves' Guild so that she could have a chat with the infamous Delvin Mallory, and found herself rather expeditiously caught up in Mercer Frey's net. After meeting Carlia properly, walking off a chest wound, stealthing her way through the Markarth Museum for the tools to decode Gallus' journal, and joining the Nightingales, 
Adlog finally joined Curly and Brynjolf to bring the Hammer of Justice down on Mercer's head once and for all. With all that squared away, Adlog returned the skeleton key to Nocturnal, picked up a fresh new talent for subterfuge, and upon her return to Delvin, having completed a job or two, she found herself sailing to Solstheim to deal with, of all things, a pirate problem. One that ran her directly into the path of our next character. Not much one for small talk then, I take it? Not really. Solvander Ferrain was a member of the Rettering Guard before he got on the wrong side of the Sea Tiger. Sol grew up in Ravenrock after his father Ashardon got reassigned there from Blacklight and brought his son and elder brother, Sol's uncle, Othraeloth, with him, leaving Sol's mother back on the mainland. Rather than join his uncle at the temple, Solvander followed his father's footsteps and joined the Rettering Guard when he came of age. He lost his father in the raids of 4th Era 150, which was when Captain Moden Veleth took him under his wing. Solvander is the oldest of the cast and has seen his fair share of what life on the frontier is really like. He has a high constitution, a low tolerance for bullshit, and way more intelligence and adaptability than he tends to let on. Something that he's had to rely on more while learning his new skill set. While he used to be highly skilled in the classic heavy armor, sword and board style of the Rettering Guard, he's had to turn in most of his trusty bone mold and put down his sword in favor of lighter and easier to maneuver staves, even though he has all the magic skill of the average mud crab. Solvander's adventure started as many do, in a tavern. In his case, a few weeks after receiving an honorable discharge from the service, delivered by his friend and mentor Moden Veleth. There, in a hole in the ground called the Wretching Netch, Solvander met the Telvanni retainer Cactus in Bloom on a very begrudging mission to recruit a new steward for Master Neloth. The two of them made a deal. Sol would tell this strange Argonian who to recruit and try to help him gain Neloth's favor, if Cactus would help him, either by being his backup or by helping him fix his hands. Cactus took this deal since it would get him out of Telmithrin, and from then on the two of them became a team. After doing a few favors for Neloth and running afoul of Cactus's predecessor, Ildari, Cactus finally acquired what he was looking for, and the two headed for Winterhold to see if they could find someone better equipped to teach Sol how to use staves and soul gems. While Cactus took a tour of the college, Solvander took a pilgrimage up to the Shrine of Azura, where he was sent on the path to find and return Azura's star, an unbreaking soul gem. You have been chosen to be her champion. He and Cactus proceeded to do just that on their way to run errands for the college, which of course put them directly in the eye of a storm unleashed by the mad Thalmor wizard on Kano. After dealing with him and turning the Archmage title over to Tolfdir, they took a brief detour to deliver a handful of ingredients to Kesh the Clean, who they stumbled over while trying to find a Briar Heart for Neloth earlier in the series. Sol, of course, found himself roped along by yet another Daedric Prince, this time Periite, who rewarded him with the shield Spellbreaker for his trouble. Finally feeling ready to take on the Sea Tiger, Sol and Cactus sailed back to Solstheim to start their investigation, only for Cactus to go missing in the night. Thinking that Sigrun and her pirates had kidnapped him, and seeing a very new ship anchored offshore, Sol followed the smoke to find Atla Grayazgosh already investigating. They agreed to team up and hunt down the captain and crew of the Sea Tiger together, and in spite of the search digging up some of Solvander's mental wounds... I, uh... So? You're right. They managed to turn up what Sigrun was after, at least. Revenge on Teldrin Sero for getting her late husband killed. After reuniting somewhat unexpectedly with Cactus, who had not been kidnapped by pirates, they all took off together to hunt Sigrun down for good. Only for Sigrun to find them first instead. After escaping, boarding her ship, and nearly getting roasted in Neloth's attempts to neutralize the threat, they finally cornered Sigrun alone in the first cave that Atlug ever cleared, Broken Ore Grotto. Hi, Sigrun! Come out, come out, wherever you are! We got a song for you. We last left this team of three back aboard the Scarlet, bound from Ravenrock to Windhelm so that Cactus can have a spa day over in Stonehills. And speaking of the prodigal warlock... Trust me, I know suspicious. I grow up with suspicious. I am suspicious. Cactus in Bloom, also known as Cactus Andrethi when he needs to do paperwork, 
is an Argonian retainer of House Telvanni, and while he isn't exactly an accomplished mage, at least as far as the standards of his house are concerned, he is a powerful one. He favors shock magic when he can get away with it, but has an arsenal of spells up his lightly armored sleeves for dealing with a variety of situations, and is always keen to learn new tricks. Cactus hasn't exactly been forthright about his past, not like he has much past to be forthright about, given that he is the youngest member of the cast. But we do know that he was raised by a Dunmer, the late wizard Azeron Andrethi, out on the Telvanni Isles of Morrowind. Given his age, it can be assumed that Cactus was something of a prodigy in the magical arts, but upon Azeron's death, he was forced to flee from the Isles and sought refuge and further study at Telmethrin on Solstein. It would be an understatement to say that his vindictive and prideful personality hasn't been the best fit for him as one of Master Nelos' apprentices. And he doesn't exactly treat his apprentices with the utmost respect or regard for personal safety. Just ask Ildari! Cactus's story began at Tel Mithrin, having just finished writing and burning a letter to his late mentor. After which, Nelos sent him on an errand to find his missing steward, Verona. Finding her dead, he was then sent to recruit someone new to make Nelos Canis Root tea, whereupon he met Solvander Ferrain, the recently discharged former Rhetoran Guard. The two of them made a deal, and after having a particularly rough time at Fort Frostmoth, Cactus took it upon himself to teach Sol how to use staves properly. But seriously, I can't have you running around not knowing how to use a staff. Those ash spawn nearly killed both of us at least twice. After running all over hither and yon doing favors for Master Neloth, Cactus finally confronted his predecessor, Ildari, who had been the victim of one of Neloth's experiments with the Heartstones. His reward, upon putting her in the ground for good, was access to Nelos' staff enchanter, and, more importantly, the Black Book that Cactus had been eyeing since his arrival at Telmithrin. After deciding to get the Oblivion off Solstein before Nelos did something to him, he and Solvander boarded the Northern Maiden bound for Windhelm. Aboard the ship, Cactus read the Black Book and found himself snout to eyeballs with the Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora. It didn't take him long to prove worthy of the attention. Upon arriving at the College of Winterholt in pursuit of someone to either teach Sol more or heal his hands, Cactus found himself both caught up in a mystery regarding the Eye of Magnus and assisting Solvander in his mission to retrieve Azura's star. They didn't just find the star in Illinalta's Deep, but also an enchanted ebony sword which Sol offered to teach Cactus how to wield properly. After getting especially snippy with a Synod researcher, Go then, back to your college. Ooh. Call me stupid, I am not stupid. And finally defeating the Thalmor wizard on Kano, Cactus agreed to go back to Solstein to fulfill his end of the deal he originally made with Sol, helping him investigate the Sea Tiger. Of course, when they got back to Ravenrock and attempted to get some sleep for the night, Cactus learned the hard way why one shouldn't fall asleep on watch. He woke up not in the retching Netch, but at an old temple hammering away at the stone. In an effort to figure out what was going on, he and Freya the Skull teamed up to investigate, and were attacked by Mirak's cultists. In the depths of the temple, they found a black book, and Mirak. Cactus took it upon himself to deal with the first dragonborn, entirely out of spite. Oh, hello. Oh. What are you doing here? And in the process, found Hermaeus Moro's favor in the form of a few new tricks. In spite of not actually being Dragonborn himself, but instead simply assisted by a Daedric Prince, Cactus soon learned just enough to get him to the summit of Apocrypha, where he soundly defeated Mirak and took his place as the False Dragonborn. Afterward, he returned to find that Solvander had teamed up with Captain Atlog while he was gone, and that both of them assumed he'd been captured by the crew of the Sea Tiger. Cactus rejoined the team, and in the process of tracking down Sigrun, Atlug managed to get him to open up a little about where he came from, a conversation that Solvander accidentally overheard. On their way across the Sea of Ghosts, Sol had a talk with Cactus about his past, acknowledging his lack of a half-decent father figure since Azeron's death, if in a roundabout way. I don't want you thinking you have to prove yourself like I did. It's a good way to get yourself into trouble you might not recover from. We last left Cactus with Atlug and Sol aboard the Scarlet and bound for Windhelm. But they aren't the only team headed in that direction. I'm including these two under the same heading because they've been together since their first episode, with a couple of exceptions. 
I'll go over each of their backstories separately, but their in-game story together in light of that. Strap in, folks. This got very long. So here we are. Crazy old man. A blind dragonborn. And me. And what are you? Just some nice. dunmer. Yes. Myth Idros is a bastard, born in blacklight to an eccentric, unpredictable mother, and a father who was, at the time, clawing his way up through the ranks of the ailing and scattered Morag Tong. Davin Idros is now a master in the business, and Myth followed in his footsteps to become an accomplished assassin and infiltrator in his own right. Myth is a natural shadow mage, meaning that he can, if he aims right and the light cooperates, hit someone across the room, even without his bow. He is a ranged weapon, favoring daggers over longer blades since they tend to be better for stealth, though he is somewhat proficient with longswords as well. His greatest talents, however, lie in his ability to blend in with most social groups, from beggars to workers to nobility. Now then, here's my invitation. I don't have a poison dagger strapped to my thigh, etc., etc. I'm just doing my duty, sir. Everything's in order. Welcome back, sir. Yes, yes. Now, to find myself a drink. I lied. Perhaps he is my type. <laughs> he has just enough self-control to be diplomatic when pressed, a skill which bought him his most recent mission, earning the favor of the Stormcloak-aligned Jarls of Skyrim in an attempt to surreptitiously expand the reach and relevance of the Tong. <laughs> what are you laughing about? Her source is Trust Me. Sira, formerly known as Sirolata Ilkaranya of Sorian of Kalandenieta, came from a wealthy and distinguished family of Thalmor sympathizers in Shimmerin. She had a comfortable life in her younger years, before the Great War and its aftermath turned the Somerset Isles into a seething cauldron of paranoia and societal pressure. Being the youngest in her family, Cyrilata was allowed a bit more freedom, and used it to escape into endless books at the Monastery of Serene Harmony. Her devotion to Xarxes and her endless searching for hope in the midst of living in an extremely hostile social environment led her to studying the possible ascension of Talos, and drawing connections between him and Xarxes. Connections which were deemed heresy when she trusted her elder brother with her thoughts. In order to protect their family's standing, Cyril Lada was thoroughly and violently excommunicated from Altmer society and exiled from the Somerset Isles. The Thalmor shipped her to Skyrim, the most hostile province possible for her to end up in, and ordered her execution by exposure or torment. The Justicier in charge of carrying out these orders destroyed her eyes before a patrol marched her across Skyrim only to dump her in a cave in the foothills of the Velothi Mountains. Syrah didn't stay in that cave for long. Driven by spite, she survived the march and her injuries, and managed to find a robe and a stick before a gang of reefers abducted her, which was where Myth found her on his way through a hidden mountain pass from Morrowind into Skyrim. After disposing of a cavern full of brewers and smugglers, he and Syrah fought off the remaining reefers in the main smuggling passage. Their first meeting was unexpected on both fronts, as Myth resolved to help his newly blinded charge get out of the tunnels and back to civilization, at least. <laughs> you... you expected to get through a Riva den? Just like that? Did you think it would be empty? Well, I did expect them to look at my papers before they started trying to gut me. Sadly for them. The two of them stuck together after that, both for safety and for a good cover story. It didn't take them long to suss out the Butcher and pick up a few errands to run for the people of Windhelm. While discussing Syrah's hesitance to travel to Riften on the off chance that the Thalmor could find her again, Atla Groyazgosh introduced herself to the two of them, and offered to travel with them, since she was headed that way anyway. They split up on arrival, Syrah taking some time to rest her legs while Myth delivered a message to Grelod the Kind. A message whose reply ended up being delivered to the wrong Dunmer. Uh... Cactus, do you have any idea what this means? Mm. Nope. Not really. Looks like something the Morag Tongue would do. That meant that Myth had no warning when, after retrieving the white file with Syra, Astrid got the jump on him, drugged him, and dragged him out to Morthal, which left her to find her way back to Windhelm alone the next morning. 
While Sira got to work repairing the Aratina residence, Myth got to work repaying Astrid's hospitality with interest. He got lost and nearly mauled to death in the swamps before making contact with a curious young breechwoman, who he hired as a guide in exchange for a few odds and ends. The two of them cleared out the Dark Brotherhood Sanctuary in Falkreath, though Myth did most of the clearing, then settled for the night in Dragonbridge so that Myth could write to his father, having dealt with their competition. The two of them broke off around Whiterun, and Myth returned to a terrified, incensed, and extremely grateful Syra. Their errands as planned got thoroughly interrupted on the road outside Kynesgrove, where, upon killing a dragon for the first time, Syra Lada discovered that she is, in fact, Dragonborn. The two of them spent the next leg of their journey together learning both what that meant and ducking questions about what business brought Myth to Skyrim in the first place. And once again we circle back to why does the mysterious Myth Idros have assassins after him? When they met Delphine and found themselves tasked with infiltrating the Thalmor Embassy of all places, Myth volunteered to save Sira the trouble. After all, You can't hide from me. That's why you're wrong, sir. I'm an infiltrator. Hiding is my job. Myth came back from Solitude with information on some dude who probably used to work around Delphine, and Syra had her first real confrontation with the Thalmor since her botched execution. After learning from both Esbern and Parthenax the real scope of the dragon situation, they jointly decided they were extremely ill-prepared to take on the World Eater as they stood. A chance encounter saw Syra and Myth joining the Dawnguard in search of both Elder Scrolls and potentially some low-light combat training which of course led them to finding Serana trapped at the bottom of Dim Hollow Crypt. Myth took over the duty of bringing her home since Castle Volkahar is within spitting distance of Northwatch Keep, a place with which Sira is painfully familiar, and upon returning having nearly lost his nerve declining Harkin's offer to become a vampire, and nearly frozen himself trying to stealth his way around Northwatch, Myth let his guard down for just long enough to surprise Sira with a hug. Well, that was... sudden. Yeah, well, I have. We should find a fire. Thus began, once more, the time honored tradition of a scholar and an assassin definitely not flirting with each other on their way to retrieve Oriel's bow. Along the way, however, Myth started to realize, through talking with Serana, that she and Sira weren't the only ones in the party with family of origin issues. Issues that came bubbling up to the surface when Myth received a disappointed letter from his father, which Sira convinced him to put aside for the moment while they dealt with the vampire menace. After a somewhat harrowing trek through the Forgotten Valley to finally confront Verther and take the bow, Myth, Sira, Serana, and the combined force of the Dawnguard all marched on Castle Vogahar to put Harkin down once and for all. In the fray, a gargoyle broke Myth's arm, and in the aftermath of both the battle and the healing, he and Sira finally got the chance to talk about their feelings for each other. Maybe I've ended up so fond of you because you're an excellent distraction. Fond of me? It would seem that the feeling is mutual. They intended to take a break after that, but on their way up to the throat of the world to retrieve some unmelting snow for Quintus at the White File, the reason they joined the Dawnguard in the first place dropped down on their heads. We last left the two of them hunkering down at High Hrothgar after an unexpected stalemate with the World Eater, having resolved to deliver the snow to Windhelm in the morning. Which makes you wonder, who else they might find there? There is, after all, one more player in this game. Are they dead? Oh. I... Perhaps I'm a bit better at this than I thought. Anna Croi is the other character that was built specifically for this story. She was born and raised in one of the most inhospitable regions in Skyrim, the hills and mountains of the Reach. She spent her formative years evading city folk and watching bickering clans raid and destroy each other. The Reach after Madanok's capture had devolved into an environment of violence and chaos, for which Enna could only blame one man, Ulfric Stormcloak, the Bear of Markarth. Enna learned the old ways from her granny Melka the Hagraven, 
and from the late members of her clan, taking up the name Crow-Eye as a nod to both her sharp vision and her friendship with her oft errant familiar, Crook. And what have you got to say for yourself there? Oh. She has all the skills she needs to survive in the hostile Karth River Gorge, having trained herself for stealth, archery, alchemy, blade work, and sometimes brutal hedge magic that can consume the dead as well as the living. While she doesn't have many skills whatsoever when it comes to dealing with city people, Anna speaks the language of the Reach as her mother tongue. One couldn't ask for a better guide through the hills, or a worse enemy to find lurking within them. Anna's story started when she noticed a gang of Silverblood mercenaries occupying Carthwaston, a town that she had the habit of watching from her perch above Blind Cliff Cave. Her investigation of who sent them led her to the city of Margarth, where she soon found herself embroiled in a conspiracy involving her own people. After meeting and subsequently freeing Madanok and the Druidok clan, Anna returned home to find that Petra had betrayed Melka in her absence, having sided instead with the hostile faction at Sundered Towers. After checking in with Madanok, Anna spoke with the Hermit of the Crag, a hagraven roosting around Ragenwald, who gave her some direction in the form of a riddle. Unsure how to interpret said riddle, Anna headed back to Markarth to start picking up where Nepos left off, as far as getting into the good graces of any Reachman sympathizers still left. Part of this involved gathering materials for the woman trying to fix up the Warrens, which led her north. While procrastinating heading into solitude by way of gathering herbs, she ran into Myth Idros, who had in turn run into a pack of werewolves. She helped him fend them off. And you're not afraid I'd kill you for overhearing? Well, I wasn't before you said that. Then teamed up with him to guide him to the Dark Brotherhood Sanctuary for the price of a black soul gem and a bow that could trap a soul in it. After that, they headed east, so that she could eventually pick up a donation from someone at Riften, but they instead parted ways at Whiterun, when Enna saw a giant eagle statue presiding over Yorvaskar in the distance. While she has no love for Nords, Enna saw the potential in learning how to fight like them, and in seeking both training and answers about who built the Skyforge, she joined the Companions. Along the way, she uncovered an old curse stemming back to the Glen Moral Coven, about which she wasn't terribly surprised. When the opportunity presented itself, Enna became a werewolf, reveling in her newfound strength, and set out to practice the art of war with Ayella as her teacher. Eventually, of course, Codlac caught them, and sent Enna off in search of a cure for their affliction, pitting Enna against her own people. This, however, was something that she was no stranger to, and took one of the Hagraven's heads with as much respect as she could manage given the grisly task at hand. On her return, however, she found Codlac dead, and she and Vilkis retaliated against the Silver Hand before finally meeting up with the remaining Circle one final time to free Codlac's spirit. After that, Enna saw no further reason to stay with the Companions, and returned to the Reach to find the Karthspire camp destroyed, and decided that the path of Hestra, the path of war, had come to her. She started at Sunder Towers by retrieving Red Eagle's sword, then completed Red Eagle's rite, raising him back from the dead and binding the remnants of his soul and a black soul gem to take with her. She established a peace treaty between all the pariah folk of the Reach, between the Orc strongholds and the Forsworn tribes loyal to Clan Druidok and Art Madanok. After that, Enna tore her way through hostile clans, Stormcloak camps, and a bandit-occupied mine to secure resources and border control for the loyal clans. Finally, she took on the Crown of the Reach, Lost Valley Redoubt, assisted in no small part by her first dragon encounter. After kiting it into the camp and felling it, however, something very strange indeed happened, and not necessarily to her. Red Eagle, you have some explaining to do. Once she'd given a report to the matriarch at Hagrock Redoubt, Anna summoned Red Eagle, as voiced by the panicked monk, from his gem to have a chat about it. He revealed a great deal to her, including just how deep the roots of the Forsworn's bereavement goes. Armed with this new knowledge and resolve, Enna is now poised to hunt down a bear. A bear that happens to live in Windhelm. So yeah, it's a long story, and you might be able to tell where I'm going to smash all of these plots into each other if you squint. This story is powered in large part by my patrons, all of whom appear at the end of each video, and get to hear most of my bloopers, at least the ones that I remember to save. Is this technically the end of the video? Yes, it is, which means it's time for an update on the current hiatus. As you might be able to guess, I have a lot that needs to get done. 
You might have noticed that the ratio of cutscene to gameplay went way up in the last few episodes, and that is because... Well, I'm about to commit acts of narrative, and I needed to crack the characters open a little bit in advance. I'm hoping it lives up to the hype, and I'm trying to be careful not to promise anything too wild. This is still Skyrim I'm working with here. Part of the hiatus is undoubtedly going to be taken up by rerunning Dindalod and fixing whatever errors I managed to stir up in the process, by the way. The mismatched Imperial forts are starting to bother me, and since we're going to be looking at a lot of them in the near future... Yeah, I need to fix that. And with that, I'm gonna go give my voice a rest. Keep on keeping on, y'all.